work. So, uh, at their agencies, because there's much work to be done. I now recognize myself for five minutes to give an opening statement. And good morning. I appreciate our witnesses for appearing today. Uh, the last time you appeared before this committee, we were facing significant turmoil in our regional banking system. Uh, since then, you have employed a never let a crisis go to waste mantra, attempting to use recent um, uncertainty to justify your sweeping rewrite of regulations for U.S. financial institutions. It doesn't go unnoticed. No one is buying that spend, by the way. The most significant proposals, including, including the Basel III endgame, are overwhelmingly dominated by provisions that have nothing to do with what happened in March. Rather, it appears the onslaught of your agency's regulatory proposals are intended to turn private banks and financial institutions into public utilities. This would put unelected bureaucrats in charge of balance sheets, credit flows, and evaluation of what is and is not considered risky. So let's start with the Basel III in-game proposal, which involves hundreds of billions or even trillions of dollars of resource allocation. This initiative was put forward with no convincing rationale, no credible motivation, and a shocking lack of supportive quantitative economic analysis. Even worse, the Basel III in-game would stifle economic growth here in America and globally, limiting lending and hindering the American dream of home ownership for families across the country. Additionally, banking regulators appear to have abandoned even the slightest notion of promoting American interests. Instead, you've ceded your authority over to US, uh, financial regula of US financial regulation to <laughs> opaque and unelected and unaccountable uh, global governance bodies and NGOs, allowing European counterparts to set the agenda and put our financial system at a competitive disadvantage. One need only look at the recently proposed federal principles for climate-related risk management. These principles align closely with those being pushed uh, by global governance bodies rather than the best interests of our financial system or even uh, the effects of climate change here in the United States. Regardless of whether you call it guidance or regulation, these principles are significant, did not go through the appropriate process as governed by the Administrative Procedures Act. That's why I will request a GAO exam, uh, to request GAO to examine whether they constituted rule and would be subjected uh, to the Congressional Review Act. Similarly, in a win for consumer protection, the GAO recently ruled that the SEC's misguidance, uh, SAB 121, does meet the um, administration, uh, Administrative Procedures Act's definition of a rule, making it subject, uh, subjected to the CRA. It seems the only area Biden financial regulators don't take their cues from foreign counterparties is digital assets, by the way. While other jurisdictions implement robust consumer protections and clear regulatory frameworks, we continue to fall behind, especially this administration. I'll finish with this. There appears to be a desire to remake the American financial system to better align with regulators' political preferences, rather than to dutifully implement the laws enacted by Congress. These supposedly independent regulators are blindly following orders from the White House and political activists leading to gross mismanagement of their agencies in the American economy. Just this week, alleged widespread and entrenched misconduct by FDIC employees were reported by the Wall Street Journal. That was well covered in yesterday's hearing. Uh, this, uh, this misconduct is a severe departure from the agency's operations to execute its mission. We often hear in the halls of Congress that things will happen because someone has the votes to make it happen. Unelected banking regulators seem to be using a similar political calculus to push their partisan agendas, whether it's at the FDIC or at the Federal Reserve for regulatory policy. Uh, the stakes are way too high to take your eye off the ball or to play political games. You must focus on the long-term safety, soundness, and stability of our financial system for the benefit of the American people and American families and American workers. Rather than focus on partisanship, misleading rhetoric, or short-term political gains. This isn't about politics. This is about doing what's right for the American economy for the long term. It's about safety and soundness in the long run. And it seems like these proposals we're, we're seeing for ga bank capital are about policy preferences, not driven by economic analysis. 
That's concerning. And Mr. Barr, that should be concerning to you at the Federal Reserve. I think the importance of the Federal Reserve's independence for monetary policy is important. You are jeopardizing it by your regulatory actions. I yield back. Now recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentlewoman from California, for four minutes for an opening statement. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing, continuing the tradition that Democrats started in holding semi-annual hearings to provide oversight of our prudential regulators. I want to take this opportunity to applaud our nation's regulators. After the failures of Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and First Republic, which marked the second, third, and fourth largest bank failures in our history, it was our nation's regulators and President Biden's Treasury Department that protected our nation's economy. Now they are taking steps to address weaknesses in our nation's banking system, including by strengthening capital requirements. And this makes some sense because well-capitalized banks lend more. Committed Democrats are also doing our part to prevent another banking crisis. We have introduced a wave of bills to address gaps exposed by the bank failures, such as strengthening bank executive accountability. Several of these bills are advancing with broad bipartisanship in the Senate, and I urge House Republicans to take them up as well. I'm hoping we can discuss legislation today to strengthen deposit insurance to better protect small businesses and their employees. I also want to applaud our banking regulators for finalizing the Community Reinvestment Act rule, something that had not been updated in nearly three decades. So under my leadership, committee Democrats led the way to protect the CRA when the Trump administration tried to gut it, including by crashing a, a, a FDIC board meeting. So I'm pleased that regulators are taking action to combat modern day redlining. I look forward to learning more about how our regulators will implement this final rule and stand ready to craft legislation that may be necessary to bolster this effort. Finally, before I conclude, I wanna say that I am very troubled by recent reports of sexual harassment and toxic workplace culture at FDIC. All of our nation's regulators should provide safe work environments that are free from discrimination, harassment, and unfairness. So I look forward to learning more today about what is being done at the FDIC and the other banking agencies to ensure that everyone feels safe and respected in their place of work and that wrongdoers are held to account. So I thank you very much. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Lady yields back. Uh, we'll now recognize the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Financial Institutions, Mr. Foster, for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As many of our witnesses said before the Senate yesterday and in their written testimony the, for this hearing, the American banking system is sound and resilient. The bank failures earlier this year were contained, but they demonstrated that the risk taken on by a small number of firms, if not appropriately managed, can result in contagion at financial businesses across the economy, and consequently, the Americans that depend on them for essential financial services. While the stress from these bank failures earlier this year has seemingly calmed, both traditional and emerging risk persist. Traditional financial risk, like interest rate risk, and developing risks, such as rising geopolitical tensions, cyber risk, climate change, artificial intelligence, and emerging technologies present new risks that must be managed appropriately. Our prudential regulators have advanced proposals in recent months meant to ad address lessons learned from both the global financial crisis and from recent bank failures. These proposals will have an effect not only on the banking system, but on the overall U.S. economy, and it is our job to understand them. Thank you. I yield back. Gentlemen, so yields back. Today we welcome the testimony of the Honorable Michael S. Barr, Vice Chair of Supervision for the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. The Honorable Martin J. Grunberg, Chairman of the Federal uh, Chairman of the Board of the Deposit Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, Mr. Michael Sue, Acting Comptroller of the Office of Comptroller of the Currency, 
the Honorable Todd Harper, Chairman of the National Credit Union Administration. Uh, we thank each of you for your time for being here. Uh, we'll recognize each of you for five minutes for oral presentation or testimony without objection. Each of your written uh, statements will be made as a part of the rec record. We'll begin with you, uh, Vice Chair Barr. You're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, and other members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in the Federal Reserve's supervisory and regulatory activities. Our banking system is sound and resilient. The acute stress that occurred in March has receded, and banking organizations continue to report capital and liquidity ratios above minimum regulatory levels. However, some banks have recorded sizable declines in the fair value of certain assets as interest rates have increased, putting pressure on tangible capital. These banks are actively managing the resulting set of risks, but these could take some time to address. Additionally, some banks that have high reliance on uninsured deposits are using more expensive funding sources to manage their liquidity. Looking forward, preserving a sound and resilient banking system requires continued attention to address identified vulnerabilities and vigilance to changing conditions. Starting with supervision, since the bank failures earlier this year, the Federal Reserve has been moving forward with ways to improve the speed, force, and agility of supervision as appropriate. In considering improvements to supervision, we are very mindful of the differences in size, risk, and complexity of supervised institutions, and the importance of maintaining the strength and diversity of banks of all sizes that serve communities across the country. Furthermore, supervisors have been focused on addressing material risks presented by the current economic environment. This includes conducting targeted reviews at banks, exhibiting higher interest rate and liquidity risk profiles, and monitoring for potential credit deterioration, particularly within the consumer and CRE lending segments. A key component of this resilience is capital. Capital allows banks to absorb losses on those assets while continuing to serve households and businesses. In the global financial crisis, the effects of woefully undercapitalized banks had a devastating impact on our economy and resulted in the worst recession since the Great Depression. It took six years for employment to recover. More than 10 million people fell into poverty, and 6 million families lost their homes to foreclosure. And these costs occurred even with substantial support from the government. In the years following the global financial crisis, the board adopted a set of capital reforms which greatly strengthened our banking system, and capital ratios of the largest banks have more than doubled since 2009. At the same time, the U.S. banking system has grown from $12 trillion in assets to $23 trillion today, while showing strong profitability and overall market valuation. U.S. banks have enhanced their position as leaders in global capital markets activity. Importantly, these reforms have served the U.S. economy well. Our economy has grown substantially with the continued support of robust lending from a stronger banking system. The reforms to the capital requirement framework that the banking agencies proposed earlier this year are the last stage of these post-crisis capital reforms. It has long been recognized that work remained to improve how banks measure risk, which is critically important because the riskier a bank's assets are, the more capital it needs to protect against those risks. The proposed rules would apply to banks with at least 100 billion in assets, fewer than 40 of the over 4,000 banks in our banking system community banks would not be affected by this proposal. The effects for each bank would vary based on its activities and risk profile. Notably, the increases would be most substantial for the largest and most complex banks, the GSIBs, and the bulk of the estimated rise is attributable to trading and other non-lending activities. The comment period is an important part of the rulemaking process. We are providing the public nearly six months to review the proposal so they can provide meaningful comments. We welcome all comments that provide the agencies with additional data and perspectives to help ensure the rules accurately reflect risk. I would also like to briefly highlight our long-term debt proposal. In August, the agency has proposed a rule that would expand long-term debt and resolution planning requirements to additional large banks. The proposal's goal is to increase the potential options available for resolving depository institutions and to enhance overall financial stability. Importantly, the proposed requirements would be calibrated 
at a lower level relative to the largest and most complex banks in recognition of the lower systemic risk profiles of applicable banks. As with the capital rules I mentioned above, I would like to emphasize that these are proposed rules, and we look forward to hearing the public comment. Thank you, and I am happy to take your questions. We'll now recognize uh, Mr. Grunberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman McHenry, uh, Ranking Member Waters, members of the committee, I'm pleased to appear at today's hearing on oversight of prudential regulators. The U.S. banking industry has proven to be quite resilient despite the period of stress earlier this year. In the second quarter, key banking industry measures of performance remained favorable. Net income remained high by historical measures, asset quality measures were stable, and the industry remained well capitalized. However, banks report lower net interest margins and higher funding pressures for a second <coughs> consecutive quarter. Higher market interest rates caused market values for debt to generally fall during the second quarter, resulting in higher unrealized losses on securities. In the second quarter, uninsured deposits declined by 2.5%. That's a significant slowing from the 8% decline reported in the first quarter. By contrast, insured deposits increased by 0.8% during the second quarter. And also in the second quarter, depositors sought higher yields, often at non-bank financial institutions, particularly money market mutual funds. Many banks have increased deposit rates to compete, resulting in higher cost of funds. The banking industry continues to face significant downside risks from the effects of inflation, rising market interest rates, and geopolitical uncertainty. The economic outlook remains uncertain, despite relatively solid growth and low unemployment so far this year. These risks could cause credit quality and profitability to weaken, loan growth to slow, provision expenses to rise, and liquidity to become more constrained. Commercial real estate loan portfolios, particularly loans backed by office properties, face challenges when loans mature as demand for office space remains weak and property values continue to soften. Banks have tightened underwriting standards over the past year across a range of household and business loans, and they may continue to tighten further this year. The failure of three large regional banks this spring demonstrated the risk to financial stability that large regional banks can pose. The FDIC, along with the Federal Reserve and the OCC, proposed rulemakings that would enhance the resilience and improve the resolvability of large regional banks. These include a long-term debt proposal that would require a layer of loss-absorbing capacity at large banks to take losses before uninsured and insured depositors, thus decreasing the incentive for uninsured depositors to run and mitigating the need for a systemic risk exception in a future failure. In July, the banking agencies issued a notice of proposed rulemaking for Basel III. The proposal is a continuation of the federal banking agency's efforts to revise the regulatory capital framework for our largest financial institutions following the global financial crisis of 2008. Notably, it does not apply to community banks. The NPR would make important changes to address capital weaknesses identified in the 2008 financial crisis, enhance the resilience and stability of the banking system, and enable the system to better serve the U.S. economy. In addition, the FDIC is undertaking a comprehensive review of its supervision program with a focus on interest rate risk, unrealized losses on securities and loans, uninsured deposits, rapid growth, and the need when necessary to escalate supervisory matters and take action to compel compliance. In October, the banking agencies adopted a final rule to strengthen and modernize the Community Reinvestment Act. And in my written statement, I provide an overview of the Deposit Insurance Fund and an update on our resolution and asset sale activities. In closing, I would like to address a recent news report regarding incidents of sexual harassment and misbehavior at the FDIC. 
As I've indicated, I am personally disturbed and deeply troubled by the report. The FDIC is conducting a comprehensive review, including engaging an independent third party to ensure that we understand the nature of the issues and will take all appropriate actions to address them. Let me underscore that I have no higher priority than to ensure that all FDIC employees work in a safe environment where they feel valued and respected. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd be glad to answer. Now recognize uh, Mr. Sue. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, and members of the committee, I'm pleased to testify today to provide an update on the activities underway at the OCC. Despite the significant market stresses earlier this year and a challenging interest rate environment, the overall condition of the federal banking system is sound. OCC supervised banks in the aggregate have strong levels of regulatory capital and healthy levels of profitability while maintaining sufficient liquidity buffers. The OCC engages directly with the institution it supervises to ensure that they are being vigilant in managing their risks. Our recently released bank supervision operating plan for 2024 summarizes the agency's examination priorities for next year and highlights asset liability management, credit risk and allowance for credit losses, cybersecurity, operational risk, and consumer compliance risk, among others, as key areas of focus. My written statement provides an update on the agency's work advancing its key priorities of guarding against complacency, reducing inequality, adapting to digitalization, and managing climate-related financial risks at the largest banks. I'll highlight some of these efforts. Despite the relative calm in the market today, the OCC has urged the banks it supervises to stay on the balls of their feet with regards to risk management. To assist banks, the OCC has updated guidance for the industry. For, in, for example, in response to increasing risk in commercial real estate, the OCC and other regula regulators published the policy statement on prudent commercial real estate loan accommodations and workouts, which updates existing interagency supervisory guidance on CRE loan workouts and reminds banks to work prudently and constructively with creditworthy borrowers during times of financial stress. Ensuring that financial services are offered responsibly and fairly takes continued efforts and vigilance by banks, regulators, and other stakeholders. On October 24th, the federal banking agencies issued an interagency final rule implementing the Community Reinvestment Act. The CRA was enacted in 1977 to prevent redlining and encourage banks and savings associations to help meet the credit needs of the communities in which they operate, especially low and moderate income individuals and neighborhoods. The final rule modernizes the CRA by recognizing banking activities that take place beyond the physical branches and ATMs, being significantly more data-driven and objective, and providing for greater transparency. It strengthens the CRA by addressing concerns related to grade inflation and CRA ratings by better incentivizing CRA lending and investments in LMI communities. The rule tailors evaluations and data collection to bank size so that community banks do not have additional burden. Banks' relationships with third parties, including financial technology companies, continue to expand. The use of third parties has significant potential benefits, but poor third-party risk management can hurt consumers, weaken banks, and contribute to an unlevel playing field. Recently, the OCC and other regulators jointly issued uh, guidance on interagency, interagency guidance on third party uh, risk management, reminding banks of their responsibility to operate in a safe and sound manner and in compliance with applicable laws and regulations, regardless of whether their activities are performed in house or outsourced. The OCC also recognizes the considerable interest by the banking industry in artificial intelligence. To date, banks have generally approached machine learning and AI cautiously across a range of use cases. The potential benefits of more widespread adoption of AI are significant, but so are the risks, which is why we expect banks to continue to manage appropriately. In the digital asset space, attention is shifting from crypto to the tokenization of real world assets and liabilities. In contrast to crypto, tokenization is driven by solving real world settlement problems and can be developed in a safe, sound, and fair manner. Next February, the OCC will host a public symposium on tokenization to take stock of developments, help enable strong foundations, and promote public discussion. This fall, the OCC, along with the Federal Reserve and FDIC, approved principles for climate-related financial risk management for large banks. The principles are focused exclusively on risk management and do not tell bankers what customers or businesses they may or may not bank, but clarify how large banks can maintain effective risk management 
and keep their balance sheets sound so they can continue to be a source of strength to their customers and communities through a range of severe weather scenarios. In closing, <laughs> the OCC continues to be engaged in a range of efforts to ensure that OCC supervised banks operate in a safe, sound, and fair manner, meet the credit needs of their communities, treat all customers fairly, and comply with laws and regulations now and into the future. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer your questions. We'll now recognize uh, Chairman uh, Todd Harper. Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, and members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to discuss the recent work of the National Credit Union Administration. My remarks here will focus on the state of the credit union system and two legislative requests. During the last year, the credit union system has largely remained stable in its performance and resilient against economic disruptions. At the end of the second quarter, the system had $2.2 trillion in assets and $1.5 trillion in loans outstanding. And the system's aggregate net worth ratio was 10.6%, well above the 7% well-capitalized leverage ratio required by statute. The Share Insurance Fund also continues to perform well with no premiums expected at this time. And to better position the fund's liquidity in the current economic environment, the NCUA has increased overnight investments to $4 billion. Nevertheless, we should pay attention to several emerging issues and trends. Net charge-off ratios at credit unions have risen over the last year, and annualized returns on average assets have declined slightly. Increasing liquidity, interest rate, and credit default risks have also led to a drop in composite CAMELS code ratings to threes, fours, and fives. Assets in CAMEL codes three institutions, for example, increased sizably in the second quarter, especially among complex credit unions with more than $500 million in assets. Ultimately, the data from the first half of the, of the year reveal a tale of two types of credit union members. The first type are those who have shifted their share saving deposits to share certificates to capitalize on better rates. In all, time deposits have increased approximately 70% during the last year. Unless carefully managed, this switch from low paying to higher yielding accounts can expose credit unions to greater interest rate and liquidity risks. And the second type of members are those with growing financial difficulties. Delinquency rates on most loan types are rising, credit card balances are elevated and higher than what we should expect in the typical second quarter, and balances on home equity lines of credit and other second liens have increased by a third during the last four quarters. In some cases, those, household, um, uh, those increases may indicate household financial stress. Consequently, credit unions must carefully manage their credit risks going forward. Early intervention at the onset of a delinquency can improve the credit union member's financial footing and prevent a charge off. The current economic environment also underscores the importance of the NCUA's Central Liquidity Facility, or CLF for short, as a liquidity shock absorber. As of September 30th, the CLF had $19.8 billion in lending capacity. This figure contrasts sharply with nine months earlier when the CLF had $27.5 billion in lending capacity. This sizable contraction resulted from the expiration of temporary statutory enhancements that facilitated the agent member access of corporate credit unions. To address this expiration and growing liquidity risks, the NCUA board has unanimously requested that Congress restore the CLF's corporate credit union and agent member provisions, which the Congressional Budget Office has scored at no cost to the taxpayer. Additionally, it remains the policy of the NCUA board to restore the NCUA's authority to examine and supervise third-party vendors. The Government Accountability Office, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, and the NCUA's Office of Inspector General have all recommended this reform. Vendor authority would allow the NCUA to gain a better understanding of the risks present in the credit union system and close a growing regulatory blind spot. And such legislation would reduce the compliance costs due diligence burdens, and future share insurance fund premiums for credit unions. In sum, the NCUA stands ready to address the impact of the evolving risks within the credit union system, including growing liquidity, interest rate, and credit risks. The NCUA will also continue to coordinate with other financial regulators 
to ensure the overall resiliency and stability of our nation's economy. That concludes my remarks. I look forward to your questions. Thank you all for your testimony. I'll now, we'll now turn to member questions. I'll recognize myself for five minutes. I, I, I reached out to all of your agencies via letter uh, about the influence of global governance bodies, in particular the Basel Committee on Bank Supervision, the Bank uh, for International Settlements, as well as the Network for Greening of the Financial System. Um, Vice Chair Barr, uh, are Fed officials and staff from the board and from district banks compensated when they attend these meetings abroad? Sorry, sir, I, I couldn't hear the last part of your sentence. Are, are officials what? Compensated. Um, the, the staff at the agencies um, that conduct all activities on behalf of the agencies receive their... Let me ask this again. When you attend any of these three international governance bodies, meetings of them, are you compensated and are uh, board members of the Fed compensated? We're compensated by the Federal Reserve for conducting all of our But not from activities. these global bodies. You would not receive a payment from the Basel Committee or from the Bank for International Settlements? No, when we participate on behalf of the Federal Reserve, we're compensated by, by the Federal Reserve. Okay, so there's no additional income that would come from those meetings? No. Okay. Um, Acting Comptroller Sue, uh, how is Treasury and your office's work with the global go governance bodies documented? How's it, how's it documented? Um, I'm not sure. We, I mean, we we um, we keep track, obviously, of what people are doing in terms of uh, participation in these bodies, and all of that goes through the appropriate procedures internally, and make sure it's all uh, appropriate and in line, aligned with our mission, which is focused on safety and soundness and fairness. I'm not. I'm just, apology. I'm not sure what the, the question. Okay, so getting you attend these uh, the Basel yep. uh, meeting. Correct. You make decisions there. What's the reporting mechanism for Congress to know your actions there? Are there reports held internally? Uh, the agendas of the meetings are something that are uh, actively discussed and shared within the agency and across agencies to the extent that uh, we, we attend these things together. Um, I think that may be the closest to what your your your. Yeah, is there paperwork, and where would that paperwork be held? Uh, we have records retention requirements, and we abide by all of those. Okay, uh, and is that the same for you, Mr. Barr, the Fed? With respect to retention of records, yes, we we retain all government records uh, of these international bodies. So of if we had activity, if we had document requests, you all would would provide those to us. We'd be Mr. happy to, to work with you and your Mr. staff on any document requests as we usually do. All right. Um, is there compensation for your participation in these international bodies, Mr. Sue? Okay. Uh, these are the things that we don't know. Uh, they've not been uh, they've not been uh, uh, attested to previously. Vice Chair Barr, about the um, the Federal Reserve Board's announced results of the 2023 st stress, uh, stress test in June of this year. You concluded there, and, and the report concluded. Uh, it confirms that the banking system remains strong and resilient. So what economic analysis did you conduct to support uh, your, your significant change in capital requirements that you're Thank proposing? You, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the um, preamble to the rule and the rule itself discusses in detail the analysis that went into each provision of the rule with respect to uh, risk calculation. The, the rule is designed to improve the calibration of risk for things like trading activity and operational risk, uh, improve the calibration of our standardized approach with respect to credit risk, and, and the details of that are discussed in the rule. Okay, but that is objectives, and you outlined the objectives. I'm, I'm asking for economic analysis. As I'm, when we met, this is what I said I was gonna ask you about. Yes, in, in the rule itself, we went through in, in quite detail um, for each calibration, why we thought the calibration was appropriate. And then for the rule as a whole, the rule addresses the economic costs and benefits uh, of the approach and finds that the economic benefits of reducing well, risk- Certainly they do, as all agencies do. They conduct an economic analysis and say the benefits far exceed the costs. Uh, but there is no math you provide in that report that justifies your actions. 
These are political decisions you're making. That's my view of it. Without any backup for economic analysis, that's, that is what the public is to conclude. Uh, Ms. Grunberg, there's a lot of discussion about your agency. I was just wondering, since you've run the agency, been there for 20 years, have you ever been investigated for inappropriate conduct during your time at the FDIC? Pardon me? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman. All right, well, I appreciate your candor. Uh, I believe the workplace culture starts at the top. With that, uh, we'll go to the ranking member, Ms. Waters. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Gruenberg, it was troubling to learn of the sexual harassment reports stretching back more than a decade at the FDIC, with many of those harmed feeling like they had nowhere they could turn to get help. It was reported <clears throat> that you have launched a comprehensive review <clears throat> and you hired an independent firm uh, to contribute to that effort. But what other steps is your agency taking today to ensure that all employees understand that this really is a top priority to provide a safe work environment and to hold individuals that engage in these shameful acts of harassment, misogyny, and discrimination fully accountable for their misdeeds? Thank you, Congressman, for that question. Um, this is the top priority for the FDIC now uh, to get a handle on these issues and address them effectively. Um, as I indicated, I was deeply disturbed and troubled. It's quite clear that there have been FDIC employees who have experienced horrendous treatment and it needs to be addressed because it's completely unacceptable. You indicated we've uh, engaged an independent third party to do an agency-wide review, both of our Washington offices and our regional and um, field offices. And in addition, uh, we will be looking at all of our policies and procedures to ensure that they uh, are as easy as possible for any employee who believes that they've experienced improper conduct to file a complaint and file it securely and to know that they will be protected, as well as look, looking at our processes for holding individuals who engage in misconduct accountable based on the facts in the law. Um, Thank you, Chairman Grunberg. Would you commit to providing us with a detailed written plan on the steps the FDIC plans to take to address this issue in the next 15 days, as well as a written report of the findings from your comprehensive review of the matter when that concludes? Yes, Congressman, we'd be glad to do that and to be entirely transparent with, with you and the committee um, as we proceed here. Thank you. Um, I would not like, I fear, uh, we, we, we would be naive to think these cases are isolated uh, to the FDIC. So Vice Chairman Barr, Chair Harper, and Acting Comptroller Sue, would you each commit to developing a written plan that you will send to us in 15 days describing how your agency will review your sexual harassment policies and procedures, as well as engage with your workers and outside experts to identify steps your agency can take to better ensure that you have a safe workspace where all workers are respected and have meaningful ways to get help when they have been harmed. Vice Chair Barr. We'd be happy to provide the, the committee with uh, our, our detailed policies and procedures. We have strict procedures on these matters and we'd be happy to provide those to the committee. In 15 days? Yes. Thank you. Chair Harper. In recent years, the NCUA has worked to strengthen its um, anti-harassment policies, including for sexual harassment, and we will provide those policies and procedures and look at what more we can do. In 15 days? In 15 days. Thank you. Acting Comptroller Sue. Yes, absolutely yes. And you will do what? We will do uh, everything that you requested in terms of the commitment to <laughs> review everything that we have. In how sure. many days? In 15 days. Thank you uh, very much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with, it, with it, are you back? <laughs> well, it's good to know these agencies can comply quickly yeah. with oversight requests 
if only universal. Uh, we'll, we'll go to uh, the vice chair, uh, Mr. Hill, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gosh, that's so inspirational. I may start uh, straight away with uh, Chairman Grunberg. Um, you've got uh, bank merger and acquisition uh, applications pending before your agency. Could you provide us a list of, uh, of those pending applications? Uh, we'd be glad to, Congress. And, and also just note on it how long uh, since their application was accepted. So just, I wanna know the, the length of time. Thanks so much. Um, and uh, Mr. Harper, on the same sort of topic of just information, uh, I, I was looking at the statistics last year and there've been 16 banks bought by credit unions in the last year. Uh, that's of interest to both sides of the dais up here on what that means. I mean, are these tax-paying companies that are now converted to non-tax-paying cooperatives? Uh, do they convert their deposits to shares? I don't think there's enough information on this committee. Could you send me a memo on that? We would be happy to. That'd be very helpful, thank you. Um, uh, Comptroller Sue, uh, you're aware the committee's been working on stablecoin legislation under uh, Chairman McHenry's leadership for and ranking member Waters' leadership for a couple of years now, and your staff's been really helpful, and I wanna say thank you on that. Uh, Congress gave the OCC the authority to charter non-depository trust banks that limit operations to just those of a trust company and related activities. Under existing laws, a national trust bank can issue stable coins, and the OCC clearly has that legal authority to charter such a bank. Do you, do you agree with that? I agree we have the authority. Uh, it has to be done in a safe, sound, and fair manner, and that's what we're, those are the standards for any national bank, uh, Federal Savings Association. Right, there's 60 or so of uh, those non-depository trust companies under your charter authority, isn't that right? I would have to look at the details, but that sounds about right. Yeah, and as the primary federal regulator for those, uh, uh, do you think the OCC staff and your team, exam team, supervisory team, are, are uh, capable of supervising if they were to issue stable coins. Do you think you're competent at doing that? Staff is extremely capable, yes. Very good. Well, I think you do have that obligation to make sure they operate in a safe and sound manner, but I think there's been some, uh, I've heard some controversy that somehow you can't do that effectively, and I think you probably can, so I wanted to, to verify that with you. Let me stick with you. Uh, the SEC has a new custody rule, which has concerned, again, members on both sides of this dais. And under that rule of bank custodians are now have to hold client cash off balance sheet. Isn't that a fundamental shift in practice with the material impact on bank balance sheets if that were to be implemented? Uh, yeah, it would be a shift, yes. Um, have you considered how mandatory cash segregation as proposed by the SEC would impact bank operations? We've, we've looked into it, yes. Uh, do you agree with the SEC's approach? Uh, we have some concerns. You have some concerns. Vice Chair Barr, do you share those concerns with the SEC's approach to this custody rule? I think it would be a, a significant change in custody practices at banks, and yeah. we, have, we have shared that with the SEC. Yeah, I think many here on this panel have. We just don't really understand it. We know they're off chasing their concerns about digital assets, but they've swept up the whole common law and state statutory and federally statutory custody practices and it and we and I, I personally oppose it quite significantly I think it's uh, I, I would use a technical term dumb I think the way they describe their their rule uh, vice chairman Barr um, in August uh, mr. McHenry and uh, mr. Heising and I sent a letter about uh, this novel activities rule and you were very prompt in helping send your staff up to brief our staff on how that's working I want to talk a little bit about the intent of that uh, does the Fed plan on re first responding to our letter that we sent you? Uh, S Senator, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> Mr. Hill, uh, if we haven't responded to your letter, then uh, we, we will certainly respond. I'm not aware of the status of the correspondence. Okay. Um, so tell me about this non-objection status. If it proves to disincentive member banks from participating in stablecoin activities or other fintech activities, isn't, isn't that a problem? Don't we want innovation in our banking system? We, we definitely want innovation in our banking system. Uh, innovation, I think, has been you know, critical to having a thriving financial sector and a thriving economy. We want to do that in a way that makes sure we provide clarity uh, and certainty to banks participating in novel activities 
uh, with clear guardrails on safety and soundness and, and well, consumer I'd, protection. I'd ask you to follow up with the letter and follow up with uh, this idea of the justification you have for the risk to safety and soundness. There were no footnotes, there was no detail. Obviously, it was a very short letter to members. So if you could follow up in writing, I'd appreciate it. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll now go to the ranking member of the Small Business Committee, Ms. Velasquez, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Vice Chair Barr, you and I spoke recently about the Basel III proposal, potential impact on small business lending. While I'm supportive of the reforms, um, I am always concerned about small businesses' ability to access capital. What economic analysis has the Fed conducted to ensure small business lending won't be constricted or that the cost of origination won't dramatically increase because of this proposal, particularly in a high interest uh, rate environment? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman, for the question. We, we uh, agree that we want a thriving uh, small business sector. Um, small businesses are the lifeblood of their local communities. The, the rule that we have proposed uh, would not make significant changes with respect to the uh, cost of credit for small businesses. Uh, under the proposal, uh, small businesses would have, generally speaking, the same risk weight that they have under current rules, but uh, it would provide for the ability for small banks to have, small businesses to have a lower risk weight if they meet um, specified criteria. And have you factored in if, uh, the interest rate environment today? We are uh, trying to uh, develop a proposal and then finalize uh, a rule that would be appropriate throughout the economic cycle. And so have you met with any financial institutions covered by this proposal about the potential impact on their small business lending portfolios? We, we uh, do welcome comment from, uh, from all banks. We've met with banks uh, on the proposal. We've met with other members of the public and we welcome those comments. And if presented, with credible evidence from these institutions about any potentially negative effects when it comes to their small business lending portfolios, specifically, would the Fed be open to adjusting the proposal? We, we are open to all kinds of improvements to the rule. We welcome comments on the rule. We want to make sure we get the, the proposal right. We'd welcome, welcome that input. Vice Chair Barr, as you know, 40% of all small business loans are originated by community banks. And just to be clear, so there is no disagreement, community banks are exempted from this proposal, correct? That's correct. Community banks are exempt from this proposal. It, it only covers the top 37 banks in the country. Thank you. Chair Grunber, when you and I and your colleagues appear before this committee in May, you stated that it was realistic to believe a notice of proposed rulemaking on Section 956 of Dodd Frank will be released by the end of the year. Is that still your expectation? Um, Congressman, I don't know if we're going to be able to act by the end of this year. I will tell you that you know this is a joint rulemaking involving six agencies. It has had intense principal level attention of all six agencies. I think we are in general alignment, and I think we're going to move toward a reproposed rule. It may not come till the early part of next year to get everybody. Isn't that been the case for the last 12 years? Yes, no, I understand. Believe me. Believe me. As I have said it to each of you before, the statute requires a completed rulemaking within nine months, and it has been 12 years, and just so you are all aware, I will continue asking for updates on this at every future hearing until the rule is written. It is well past time you get this done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. We'll now go to uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Sessions, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, there's been a lot of discussion this morning about the integrity of these organizations that sit in front of you. I'd like to... Uh, put into the record a copy of a Wall Street Journal article that more specifically outlines without objection what this is. And I find it incomprehensible that someone would not really be able to understand this and put an immediate response out, but rather to hire somebody outside and ask that they look at the whole organization that may take months and months rather than issuing a, a direct uh, 
response to that. And Mr. Chairman, I do know that the gentlewoman, uh, the ranking member was most explicit to ask for that back in 15 days. I wanna thank her for that because I think she, like this whole committee is disgusted uh, at that uh, performance level. Not making friends and success with your employees is a difficult task. Gentlemen, I'm looking at the OCC Bulletin 2023-29, issued August 29, 2023. Long-term debt requirements for large bank holding companies, certain intermediate holding companies of foreign banking organizations, and large insured depository institutions. Notice a pro 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 proposed rulemaking. And as I go through this, not for the first time, but the first time in a couple days, as I look at this, it is rather extensive. You're telling them how to run their bank. You were giving them, in some instances, even several years to get where you want to go. Uh, I have a problem with this when I believe the organizations that might be uh, the Fed and the FDIC boards uh, might not even agree with this. What was their feedback for you before you issued this August the 29th? Mr. Greensburg? Um, the feedback from the institutions? From, from the FDIC board. Oh, well, I think uh, our board actually, I believe, voted unanimously in favor of this proposal. Um, it, it had been the subject of a long deliberative process. Uh, we actually had an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, I think back in 2022, uh, to seek comment on the whole concept before initiating a rulemaking process. So is that back to, let's say March, this long discussion? It, it, it extended, no, it actually preceded that, Congressman. It actually preceded that. And the catalyst for moving forward from these discussions, was it the March? Uh, no, I think it perhaps reinforced um, the, the, the um, value of considering the proposal, but I think it's uh, something that the three agencies, certainly the Fed and the FDIC, have been focused on previously. Uh, we had been concerned before the events of this spring. Concerned because of instability. No, uh, about the challenges relating to the failure of a large regional bank. You know, we had been very focused in the past. So did your regular reviews of these banks, as you had this opportunity to be on them, did your reviews also come up with that conclusion? Uh, you I have, you're in institutions every day. Yeah. So you started seeing something when you would come in and do, your examiners would be there, and that's what led you to this conclusion? It, it, it was the, an issue really relating, relating to the resolvability of these institutions and how they could be resolved in an orderly way, um, minimizing costs to the deposit insurance fund. And um, focused prior to the events of this spring on the risks related to concentrations of uninsured deposits at large regional banks and the value of having a buffer of long-term debt held at these institutions because- So that would mean then that they would then move back on their lending ability and save more, in essence, as a buffer against what might be that risk? No, we didn't see an impact on, on lending what we did see was replacing. But if you're requiring them to hold more, wouldn't that mean that there's less available for them for a growing economy? Well, again, Congressman, this is not capital. It's a, a debt instrument. And in effect, would be this long-term debt would replace some of the uninsured deposits that have a higher liquidity risk. This would be longer-term debt. And that longer-term debt would take losses ahead of uninsured and insured it, it, The gentleman will finish the answer for the record. Think, if I may, and I'd reduce the, the run risk of the uninsured deposits, which we actually obviously saw earlier this year, and also would reduce the 
resolution. Okay, constant. the gentleman's time has expired. We'll now go to Mr. Sherman. You, Mr. Sherman. If you'll finish answering for the record, we'd appreciate that. We'll now go to Mr. Sherman of California. Uh, and then at this point, um, we'll be able to get one more question in before, I, I think we'll get one or two more questions in before we have to go to the floor. Mr. Sherman. I'm surprised uh, to hear Republicans criticizing you for visiting Europe because European standards are lower than American standards and more in tune with what they're advocating uh, you to adopt. Um, if our standards are too low, we end up with bailouts and bankruptcies, but if our standards are unnecessarily high, we slow economic growth. It concerns me to hear your opening testimony when you describe how these regulations are a response to the 2008 crisis. It's a little late to be writing regulations in response to the 2008 crisis. The question is, will I still be alive when you write regulations responding to the 2023 crisis? Um, and that 2023 crisis is a direct result of you under uh, estimating the problems of interest rate risk. Uh, you've worked hard on these regulations, but as I'll point out to you, they uh, discriminate against the environment, they discriminate against home, uh, first time home buyers, and they discriminate against small business. Now, one of the ways they discriminate against small business is a small business, uh, the bank has very little interest rate risk. They're short term loans or their adjustable rate. You buy a 30-year bond, might be very credit worthy, might not have any credit risk, it has all that interest rate risk. I'm flabbergasted that it's taken till now for you to propose regulations to say that banks have to recognize unrealized losses uh, on held for sale securities. Um, that's flabbergasting to think that you would take an asset that the bank paid a million dollars for, that the market tells you is worth only 600,000 and count it as a million. But half these securities are in that hold to maturity account and you're not doing anything about it. Are any of you thinking of causing banks to recognize unrealized losses? And I urged this back when you were here back in March, just a few days after Silicon Valley Bank, uh, on all mark to market, all the, the, the losses on all uh, the securities. Are any of you considering that? Uh, Mr. Thank, you, Mr. thank you, Mr. Sherman. Uh, you, you raise uh, an important question. First of all, as I said at the beginning, we're open for comment on all the issues you've well, raised. You just, you've just heard my comment. And um, uh, with respect to unrealized losses, the proposal uh, is focused on uh, available for sale securities, as you point out. It's the rule we have for GSIBs. We don't have that for other large banks. This would apply that approach to, to other okay, large banks. You're doing a tiny step forward when you had a massive crisis thought to be a, finan uh, a, uh, a risk to our entire economy and you invoked that law and you're taking this tiny step and you're leaving on the balance sheet assets at a million that you know are worth 600,000. But in doing so, you're discriminating against small business. Every time a bank decides to in, is incentivized to buy that long-term debt on a securities market, that's money they can't lend to a local pizzeria. Um, speaking of discriminating, uh, well, uh, uh, against uh, first, I mentioned first-time home buyers. First-time home buyers all, all often need uh, mortgage insurance. Your current rules recognize that mortgage insurance may not be perfect, but it's useful. Can any of you raise your hands if you want to defend the idea of having a zero uh, value for, home, for, for mortgage insurance? I see no hands going up. Uh, Mr. Sherman, just to clarify, under the proposal, our treatment of private mortgage insurance doesn't change. So it's the same approach now under, the, under our guidelines, private mortgage insurance can be a factor can be a factor. several factors that contribute to a mortgage being considered prudently under it. Well, I, I would hope that you would write that, your regulations more clearly because many people have written them and uh, that, believe that you're going to assign a zero value and if that's if you intend to do otherwise. Um, Congress spends a lot of money providing these clean energy crises, uh, 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 credits and you undermine their value, you undermine congressional policy. Uh, the tax equity investments um, 
you're going to go from 100% to 400%, making them far less valuable to banks. Uh, is there anyone here who thinks that's in the interest of the environment? Uh, yes. If I may just comment, Congressman. Um, uh, this is, in a sense, the reason we have a comment period. Uh, we've received a yes. lot of thoughtful comment on this subject, and we're going to give it careful consideration in the final. I, I'm glad you're hearing our comments, and I hope uh, that you would have stress tests that look at interest rates going up and down. That's the lesson of 2023. I yield back. Gentleman yields back, novel concept of both up and down. <laughs> uh, we'll now go to the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to our guest this morning. Um, perhaps the greatest threat to our financial stability is our economic ties to China and the Chinese Communist Party. Recently, I met with a market expert about the likely scenario that China will invade Taiwan by 2027 and the U.S. sanctions that will immediately be put on those folks and, and will follow that action. His analysis shows that our market will immediately drop 50 to 80 percent. I understand none of you are directly responsible for U.S. sanctions policy, but the effects of those sanctions will have a direct impact on the American institutions that you regulate. Mr. Su, how often do you meet with Secretary Yellen, Department of Defense, intelligence officials, and leaders of industry, leaders of industry, to develop a plan that would mitigate the fallout from this apparent inevitability? So there are regular conversations uh, at different levels to deal with, um, to assess risks to the banking system. Um, and those, are, those span a range of topics. So sometimes it's through uh, discussions about cybersecurity that's often a focus for a lot of those kinds of interactions, but they also span some of the issues that you're talking about. Okay, so do you, do you put together a plan? Or are you working with our allies with regards to a set of sanctions that would be put in place when that activity, whenever the Chinese invade? Our, our expectation is that banks are prepared for a range of scenarios especially those banks with uh, global operations that may be impacted by in, uh, issues such as the events. Okay, that, such okay. As the my question is, and I've asked this question of Secretary Yellen and Chairman Powell in this committee, um, and we talked to the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury the other day about this as well. Should this happen, have we decided, have, are, we, are we working with a set of allies on a kind of sanctions that we put in place as per what happened with Russia? It took us two or three months to put our sanctions in place. We will, if we don't have this ready immediately, three or four weeks is going to be too late. It's all going to be over. So the question is, number one, you've answered it with regards to having some discussions across the board, but are you putting in place a set of plans for a set of sanctions that you will put in place immediately when that action takes place? So sanctions policy is not uh, in our jurisdiction, but we do communicate, communication and coordination for the kinds of events that you described are critical, okay. and we focus a lot of attention on ensuring that we have those channels of communication and coordination. Uh, in okay, Mr. Harper, are you, are you involved in those discussions at all? No. Are you concerned at all about the impact that that would have on credit unions across this country whenever that action takes place? Uh, certainly, I'm concerned about all material actions, regardless of the source of them. Uh, Mr. Grunberg, are you concerned about it at all? Have you talked about it with these guys involved in discussions? Um, you raise a, a critical issue, Congressman. Um, uh, there are contingency plans, but for me to respond, if you don't mind, I'd like to come back to you if I, I yeah, want to be careful. Because as, you, as you all know, the interest rate risk problem that you've dealt with uh, back in March is going to be a teeny tiny thing compared to what this would be. Thank so you. I think we need to be thinking about this in terms of how we can address this for the, for, the, for the protection of our whole system, not individual banks. Okay, uh, Mr. Barr, last year the Durban credit uh, debit rule was cited by the Government Accountability Office as causing significant damage to checking account access. Research is conclusive that merchants never lowered consumer prices in response to the Fed's rule, and community banks and credit unions have borne the brunt of this harm's regulation. I believe the number is 98% of the money did not go back to consumers as they had promised. And in fact, I've got a, uh, from February 2011, uh, in an investor call, Home Depot CFO reported the rule would increase their profits by $35 million in that year. So obviously, they, they, they didn't intend to give the money back either. So are you concerned by the result of, of the consumers paying more for services and small banks having to merge or close as a result of losing, losing this income stream? Uh, thank you very much for the question. The, the rule does not affect uh, community banks. The rule is as Congress provided, affects institutions over $10 billion in, in asset size. 
the Congress has directed the Federal Reserve to uh, ensure that debit card interchange fees are reasonable and proportionate to a set of specified we're, costs. We're, we're looking now at regular credit cards, sir, and with all due respect, I just got done talking to a bank recently that said the examiners were telling him that, yep, I realize it doesn't apply to you, but it's a good idea if you start working on the rule and start thinking about that. Next time I have a, have a story like that, I'm gonna come back to you, sir. Please do. This has, got, this has got to stop. So, um, Mr. Uh, Harper, are you concerned about that, that rule at all with regards to the impact on credit unions? So I'm not familiar with the study that you cited, but certainly we look at everything that does affect uh, credit unions. Um, uh, generally, as uh, Mr. Barr pointed out, uh, the rule applies to those think, institutions. You know, there's going to be discussion about this as a rule is trying size. to, people are trying to put it together in the Senate. It's going to come over here. We've got to put a stop to this. It's not the panacea that think people think it is. It is going to be a direct cost to the consumers. It's going to hurt the, the small banks especially, regardless of whether you think it's only going to be the ones over 100. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. We'll now go to the ranking member of the Agriculture Committee, Mr. Scott, for five minutes. And then we'll, we'll break for votes. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Um, Vice, Chair uh, Vice Chairman Barr, uh, I want you to know that I have some serious concerns with the bank capital requirements that you are proposing. And this is why, not only with the impact it will have on our smaller farmers and their ability to access uh, capital, but also on the increases to the cost of derivatives transactions, meaning higher prices for everyday consumers. So, uh, Vice Chairman Barr, also American companies like manufacturers, airlines, in addition to our small farmers and retailers all rely on derivatives to responsibly hedge their risk for commodity fluctuations for fuel costs, interest rates increasing. This is deep into the very soul of our business and our total economic and all of these inherent costs and imbalances impact the average consumer. So we got a sort of a big problem here. Uh, I fear that making these hedges more costly for all of these major industries, airlines, the manufacturers, as I mentioned, will only make the cost of goods and services, food prices at our grocery stores, airline tickets, gasoline at our station, our very everyday American households more expensive. So you see, I have some very pressing concerns about your proposal. So, Vice Chair, did your analysis for the Basel III in-game proposal include the impact on this broader economy? And if American companies cannot afford to hedge their risks, with the valuable tool of derivatives. Uh, thank you, Mr. Scott. Uh, we, we do think that the derivatives proposals as part of this package of uh, capital reforms will improve the resilience of banks that need to provide the kinds of services that you've just described. So it's important for the economy, it's important for farmers, it's important for businesses, it's important for those who rely on derivatives that banks can be healthy and strong in providing those services. And that, that is the reason for increasing resilience uh, of the banking sector in that way. 
Well, I have received some very pressing concerns about the impact of what you are doing. And are you aware of this? And if so, are there adjustments that you might make in your proposal? We, we are um, open um, for, for any comments on the rule, including with respect to derivatives and users, that would help us better understand the, the costs and the benefits of the rule. And we're open to improving the rule in all ways. Well, I hope so. And uh, as um, our chairman mentioned, I'm the ranking member of our agriculture committee, as you may know, and our farmers are very concerned about this. I think you are aware of this, but it's good to hear that you're willing to make some adjustments because this is a great concern to many people in our nation. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. We'll now recess until uh, votes uh, uh, end, which will be close to noon. Um, but when two members reappear, uh, we'll consult with uh, both staffs and try to get things rolling as quickly as we can when we get back. Uh, so with that, committee stands in recess.